um, is, is talking about this movement in the 18th century, people, the French Revolution, the French uh, philosophers calling themselves the party of humanity, universalism, and Smith says, well, yes, it's true that if you are patriotic, that can actually encourage people to do some things that might be harmful to people in other places. Parochialism, patriotism, groupishness, this can have some negative effects. He doesn't dispute that. But then look what he says. He suggests that actually a parochial world is a better world from a straight utilitarian point of view. Look what he says. That wisdom which contrived the system of human affections seems to have judged that the interest of the great society of mankind would be best promoted by directing the principal attention of each individual to that particular portion of it which was most within the sphere both of his abilities and of his understanding. In other words, think local, act local. If your slogan is, think global, act local, it's not going to produce as much local action. And this is why studies, it's, the, the data is a little bit, is sometimes contested, but I think there's a lot of data suggesting that conservatives are more charitable, they give more blood, they basically do more for others than do liberals. Liberals support policies of welfare, government policies to help people, but when given chances to help, conservatives end up giving more. Is that because they, as people, are better people? Is that their elephants are more habitually generous? Maybe a little bit, maybe not, I don't know. But what I'm confident in is that because conservatives set themselves up in parochial communities, they join churches, they're more likely to join their neighborhood associations, they're more local, they're less cosmopolitan, they travel less, they're more rooted. You put yourself into groups, you're going to be more compassionate. So again, if you set up your environment, your situation, your society to encourage this kind of Adam Smith parochialism, that might well be a better society than one in which we try to get everybody to give to save Darfur. In conclusion, if we return to this puzzle, uh, if compassion is so good for us, why doesn't everyone pursue it? Well, yes, there are psychological obstacles, but I believe much more powerful are the moral and political obstacles. And if, um, so, as, so as, as I said, uh, I made these points, if morality is broader than most liberals think, um, then you're going to have to broaden your moral, uh, your moral thinking, your moral appeals. You might consider some conservative ideas, uh, 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 such as constrained parochialism. Um, I suggested that the, uh, be, the, the most productive avenue of intervention is especially down here, not up here. Uh, and so if we return to the mission of sea care, of searching for methods for cultivating compassion and promoting altruism within individuals and society-wide, my closing recommendation is this. Yes, draw on Eastern wisdom. There's a great deal of Eastern wisdom. But specifically, it is use indirect methods rather than direct, and I think this is an area where the East is wiser than the West, use indirect methods, that is changing the path, not the people. And secondly, recognize that the whole community of people doing this research probably funding this research, um, uh, advocating for these programs politically, is generally speaking members of a single moral community with a care-based morality. So if your whole community is yin, you better consult some yang. And that's my closing words to you. Thank you. Perhaps commenting, before we take questions, since I'm quoted, I, I'd like to respond a little bit. It is interesting that we can make any argument if we use the extremes of behavior to focus a light on that, which I think in some ways my friend and colleague, Dr. Hyde, has done. But uh, I'm certainly in agreement, though, with the fact that a lot of our actions are actions of context and Certainly, I don't think anyone's intent, at least in our group and what we strive to do, either focuses strictly on the yin without the yang. We are human beings. We are mammals. We are products of evolution. And as a result of that, we have limitations. And in fact, I would argue with you, and I think it supports what Dr. Haidt has said, the part of the problem here is that we have become a global community, our evolutionary construct in the way in which we act has not caught up with that to our failings, if you will. That we are not actually prepared with the tools that we have been given by evolution 
to respond to the world in which we are at today. It is interesting when we talk about, as an example here, of the Tea Party movement. You know, I lived in the Bible Belt for a while. Now, this is one of the most obviously religious places in the world, isn't it? This is where people espouse the values of the Bible. Yet, in that community, what do you see there? You see one of the highest divorce rates in the United States. You see one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the United States. You see one of the highest high school dropout rates in the United States. You see one of the highest levels of poverty in the United States. Yet, if we use the construct that we're talking about, which is religiosity, it is a chimera, I would suggest to you, because we are human beings who have the failings of human beings. It is wonderful to espouse a doctrine of boundaries, controls, constraints. Unfortunately, most of us can't live within them. I would say that the liberal ideology is one which says we are humans, we have failings, and it is not to disregard our failings as humans, our frailties, our insecurities. It is to say they exist, let's not hide from them. Let us not paint a picture and create an image of what we present to people that in fact is a falsity, but what we should in fact do is align who we are with the image that we project and then use the social constructs of our evolution to embrace that and in, to embrace others no matter who they are. I don't think anyone, at least I certainly don't believe, that compassion means you're weak or that you get walked on. I would say to you that we should have a fierce compassion that demands boundaries, that demands insights, and we look at the entire picture and not let people off of the hook. But in the face of that, to still be able to open your hearts to those individuals around you who actually are suffering. And that suffering does not necessarily have to be horrible poverty. It can be emotional suffering. So in that context, I would say that while our agenda is to promote compassion, and interestingly, liberals and uh, conservatives never argue with that, each of us has something which resonates us within us which will allow transcendence. And that transcendence will invariably involve an intersection with other individuals. Our agenda is to look at the entire spectrum and to create tools that will allow every individual to maximize that and is not to pick one thing uh, that will limit them. So on that note, that is my response. Uh, I think we're ready for any questions if anyone would like to harass Dr. Hay. <laughs> Or height, I should. We're back to height, not that's right. That's right. Uh, Yeah, I'm, what I'm interested in is empathy and um, how there's a new science uh, talk about mirror neurons that were kind of wired for empathy. Uh -huh. And I'm kind of wondering how does the, that uh, mirror neurons fit into your model? Right. And using your metaphor, the elephant and the rider both are wired for empathy. And, that they're, and the way that they're able to communicate with each other is that they have a kind of an empathic uh, connection to each other. So there's kind of that uh, physiological right. well, okay, quality. Sure, sure. So first of all, I think the rider is not in any way uh, wired for, for empathy. That's, um, the rider is, I mean, Jefferson has this one, Thomas Jefferson has this incredible dialogue between his head and his heart in which the, uh, the, head, the, the heart accuses the head of being so heartless and sticking to principle and being cold to people in the name of long-term utility. I don't, think our, I don't think the rider is, is compassionate. Um, you ask about mirror neurons. Um, mirror neurons uh, exist in many other animals. They are originally, apparently, a, a way to speed up learning and anticipation of other animals' responses. So originally, they have nothing to do with empathy or sympathy, or rather, caring. They're sort of a shortcut to learning that some animal brains do. And in humans, it seems to go a lot more. We don't just mirror each other's motor habits. 
we actually also mirror, we have mirror neurons that respond to their emotions. So we humans literally feel others' pain. You're right about that. Enjoy. We, enjoy, that's right. So yes, we are wired for compassion. That's all true. Um, um, but what I found in, in reading up on mirror neurons for my, for my book was that uh, both mirror neurons and oxytocin, which are the two main areas you'd want to look into for this, both of them show some pretty strong signs of parochial altruism. For example, there's a study by Tanya Singer in which when one per, you, 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 there are two people you're interacting with, you're in the scanner, one of them either cheated you, I think it is, and the other one didn't, or one behaved badly. And then you see uh, uh, somebody's going to get a shock in the next round. Somebody's going to get a shock. And when it's, the, uh, uh, when it's you, your brain responds exactly the same as when it's the good person. So your brain responds to the good person just as to you. But a person who violated moral rules, you don't respond to as much. That was especially true for men. Um, but my point is that our mirror neurons, even, appear to be discriminating. People who we think are not good people, we're ne- not likely to empathize with. Same thing for oxytocin. Oxytocin doesn't make you just want to love and hug everybody. It doesn't make you into John Lennon. It makes you love especially your group. Uh, some Dutch research on this showed that people became more, they favored more of their in-group and became even more negative towards Muslims uh, after they had had oxytocin. So I think mirror neurons and oxytocin actually, is, it's, it, there's just a little bit on this, but it seems, I think, to support the view that, yeah, we're wired for compassion, parochial compassion. I think this gets back to the same point I was just mentioning, is that our, from our evolution as hunter-gatherers, that is way, the way the system is wired. That's why it is, in fact, so difficult to look out on this larger view to embrace all these different groups. But I would suggest that is the challenge of our time. And uh, it is to see if we can, in fact, construct ways in which we can enlarge that in-group. Mm-hmm. You spoke this, of this, the oh, oh. Um, 